In the name of Allah, the most gracious, the most merciful, may the peace and blessings of Allah be upon the Prophet Muhammad and his purified progeny. Dear brothers and sisters, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. This is a continuation from the last episode and this is the third episode where we were discussing the seven ahruf of the Quran because the sect who refers to itself as Ahl Sunnah said that the Quran was revealed in seven ahruf. But what we presented is that their scholars differ and have a lot of difference of opinion as to, with regards to even defining what the ahruf are. So many of their scholars cannot even define, have a consensus on what the ahruf are. And we mentioned that there were around 35 to 40 opinions, as Yasir Qadi mentioned, from the scholars of the so called called Ahl sunnah or the sect that refers to itself as a Sunnah, regarding the Ahruf. And what we said is that, especially the Salafiyya when debating and discussing with those who are non-Muslims, they always like to give and the idea and put forth the argument that the Qur'an is perfectly preserved. But if a non-Muslim were to actually look into their texts and look into this issue of the seven Ahruf and how some of the Sahaba recited verses of the Qur'an in a different way which do not exist now, even in the Qira'at, in the seven different readings, the non-Muslim would come to the conclusion that their Qur'an, according to their standards, cannot be preserved in the correct manner. And of course, Yasir Qadi, a very big Qur'anic ex uh, sciences scholar for them, who has authored one of the most popular or most popular wor work in the English language for the sect who refers to itself as Ahl Sunnah, he in fact secretly does believe that the Qur'an has not been perfectly preserved as we have shown from some emails. Now we left off discussing the opinions of the Ahruf, one of them being that the Ahruf were different dialects that they say and then the others saying that no it could be the seven Qira'at and there are many opinions but we do not have time to mention them all. So what we do is that we continue about discussing about some of the Sahaba and how they recited the Qur'an in a different manner. Now Abdullah bin Masood, one of the companions, he would recite one of the verses or add to one of the verses in Surah Al-Masad. He would add وَقَدْ تَبْ تَبَّتْ يَدَىٰ أَبِي لَهَبٍ وَتَبْ وَقَدْ تَبْ So this is something that was added. But after the Uthmanic compilation of the Qur'an, where some of them say that Uthman burned so many of these Ahraf which would show the six of these Ahraf, which would show that their Qur'an is lost, um, six-sevenths of it is lost. Then what happened here? So we see that Al-A'mash, Al-Tabi'i, according to Sahih al-Bukhari, volume six, published by Dar al-Salam. How did he recite this verse? Did he follow the Sahabi in doing this? Because we get from the Salafiyya, you must follow those who are the Tabi'een, the righteous generation after the companions, because they knew the Sunnah from the companions and they learned it from them. So what we find is that on page 416, page 416, they translate the Hadith but very deceitfully. They do not translate the next part in Arabic, which would show that their Quran has in fact been added to by some of the companions. So the Salafi he argues with the non-Muslim that our Qur'an is, is preserved, nothing's been added to it, nothing's been taken out. Let's see, if nothing has been taken out, let's see what Al-A'mash, one of the Tabi'een, let's see how he recited this verse and whether he copied Abdullah bin Masood. So at the end of this hadith on page 416, the part, the ending part, I'll just read it. Then Abu Lahab went away, so the Surah, Surah Al-Masad, perish the two hands of Abu Lahab, was revealed. And then it states of us. Now, what we find here is, I'm not sure if the brothers and sisters can see it in the camera, but they can read it at home. The next part in the English was not translated. They left that out purposely. Why? Let's read the next, what it says here. So what we find is that it says about the ayah, فَنَزَلَتْ تَبَّتْ يَدَىٰ أَبِي لَهَبٍ وَتَبْ وَقَدْ تَبْ So here, they've added the part that after أَبِي لَهَبٍ وَتَبْ وَقَدْ تَبْ 
وَقَدْتَبْ So we see that this has been added in here. And what does it say? هَكَذَا قَرَعَهَا الْأَعْمَشْ So الْأَعْمَشْ, one of those from the Tabi'een, recited this addition to the verse, وَقَدْتَبْ And this is what he, what he was doing is following Abdullah bin Masood, another Sahabi. So what do we have here? We have Sahih al-Bukhari in volume 6 on page 416. They have purposely not translated the next part. Why? Because it would show to those people who do not know Arabic and who are of just of the English readers and to the non-Muslims that what? One of their Sahabis, one of their companions, sorry, one of the Tabi'een who fo supposedly followed the companions who knew the Sunnah of the Prophet Muhammad added waqad tab to Surah Al-Masad. So we ask that how can they argue for their complete preservation of the Qur'an and this is one difference dear brothers and sisters of the Shia Qur'an for Muhammad Hijab this is one difference that we have for the Qur'an in terms of the Shia and the terms in terms of their sect that their companions were able to add to the Qur'an and change words around. A tabi added to the Qur'an and when we look in the Qur'an today do we find waqad tab? Bukhari tries to justify this by saying it is only an emphasis but in fact it is still an addition of a word to the Holy Qur'an. So how do the Salafiyya solve this disaster? Because we have a Sahabi, a Sahabi who recited the Qur'an in this way that we do not find today. And then after that, we find that one from the Tabi'een recited it. This was, so who do we follow? Who do we follow from them? That they have this type of Qur'an that has been changed. So we see either way it is a disaster. If you follow one of the Sahaba, you have to follow all of the Sahaba. They were all righteous. All of them are righteous. We must follow all of them for the pure Sunnah of the Prophet Muhammad But if we follow Abdullah bin Masood, we read the Qur'an this way. Do your, do your scholars allow this? This is a question to the Salafiyya. Do your scholars allow you to read the way your Sahaba did, your companions did? Do they allow you to read like Omar did? This is one question that we raise to them. It's a disaster each way because if you follow these, um, the pious predecessors after the companions as they say, you will change the Qur'an by reading it this way and following their example. Or you follow sah Sahaba and you also change the Qur'an with the way that they recited it in. And what we said is that in Tafsir al-Qurtubi, volume 1, what did Qurtubi say? He said that what has come on the refutation of those who attack the Qur'an and oppose the text of Uthman by adding to it or removing, to, or, um, removing some of it. So al-A'mash, what did he do? He added to it. And of course, what did Qurtubi say here? <clears throat> that anyone who claims increase or decrease to it has declared the consensus false and such an action such an action astonishes people. So Qurtubi he must be astonished that someone from the Tabi'een would change the Quran in such a way. So these are the righteous generations that we must follow according to them who distorted the Qur'an. Now this all goes back to the third opinion, dear brothers and sisters of the Ahraf, that apparently some of the Sahaba were given the green light to change the Qur'an. So what they argue is that no, some of these are synonyms. Some of these words that they recited, they don't change the meaning. But again, it still collapses the argument that they have, that the Qur'an is completely preserved. What we do is that we go to Yasir Qadi, his book, on page 178. Now what we find is that Yasir Qadi, he admits here that the Qur'an can be changed. On page 178 of an introduction to the sciences of the Qur'an, he states that the seven ahruf refer to seven different ways that the verse can be changed. In other words, whenever a difference is found between these ahruf, this type of difference will fall into one of the categories. So change in wording, he mentions, I believe, seven points here. So Yasir Qadi right here 
and he lists this under the opinions of strong evidence, admits that the Qur'an can be changed and that some of the words can be changed and there's no clarification as to whether these words are divinely revealed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because the words of the Qur'an are the words of Allah. Therefore, what does this mean? This means that according to their scholars, the Sahaba, the companions can change the Qur'an. This is man putting his hand in the Qur'an and changing some of its words and Yasir Qadi in his book of Quranic Sciences admits that this is under one of the strong opinions. Therefore, their Qur'an, again for Muhammad Hijab, the Qur'an of the Shia we believe is preserved but when we go, you may think the Qur'an is preserved and you may hold this opinion. We don't deny this. He may hold this opinion but according to your text, this is not a plausible opinion because the Sahaba and the Tabi'een could change some of the Qur'an and Yasir Qadi admits this and enters, enters it under the strong opinions of the Qur'an. And as we said, the scholars still differ over the definition of Ahraf anyway, which is more problematic. Now, ah Ahmed von Denfer, Ahmed von Denfer, uh, Denfer in Ulum al-Qur'an, uh, he quotes a Zarkashi who says in Al-Burhan, volume 1, page 213, he says, most of the scholars are of the first view and that the last double reading of the Qur'an by Muhammad in the presence of the angel Jibra'il served, among others, the purpose of eliminating the other six modes. So why I've highlighted this is because we talked about preservation of the Ahruf in the last episode. According to the most dominant view in this quote, the Ahruf are not preserved. So this is a dominant view amongst those who refer to themselves as Ahlul Sunnah, showing again that much of the Qur'an is lost and this collapses the argument that the Qur'an has been completely preserved by them. And it shows us that Allah did not protect the Qur'an according to them because only one harf has been preserved. Now, dear viewers, for focus on what I've said, why have I read this quote? Because the definition according to the sect that refers to itself as Ahl sunnah is that the Qur'an has been revealed in seven Ahruf. And what do we find? We find that Zarqashi is saying here that the majority of uh, opinion, the most scholars are of the first view that these other six Ahruf have been eliminated. Therefore, what does this say about the Qur'an for the sect that refers to itself as Ahl sunnah That most of the Qur'an has been lost six-sevenths of the Qur'an has been lost. So did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala not protect his Qur'an? That these, this has been lost and this is a dominant opinion? And what we also say is that those who do argue that the Sahaba have preserved the Qur'an, we clearly see that they themselves disagreed over the recitation of the Qur'an. And so we have a brief recap of the opinion, seven dialects seven different qira'at and that the Sahaba were able to just change some of the meanings of the Holy Qur'an but this is not a befitting opinion and this is again ridiculous to think this because the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, um, as we see um, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala um, shows us that the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi says in the Holy Qur'an that قُلْ مَا يَكُونُ لِي أَنْ أُبَدِّلَ so it is not befitting it, that it does not beseem me that I change it myself. So if the Holy Prophet, the Holy Prophet if he could not change the Qur'an, then how could the Sahaba change some of the words and put man-made words in the Qur'an and mix it up with the speech of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this is something that is very problematic, of course. What we do is that we return to Yasir Qadi's book again. And dear brothers, this is not us just quoting Yasir Qadi. Yasir Qadi is in fact quoting many of their scholars which is useful for, for us because they are all on um, many of these pages. Now what <coughs> we've shown as Zarqashi who says that mm, all these Ahraf have gone, only one remains. So this Qur'an has been lost. Now what does Al-Qari, one of their scholars, what does he say? Yasir Qadi quotes him. Therefore it cannot be said that the companions purposely left out six Ahruf and preserved only one of them in the Mus'haf of Uthman without bringing forth some strong unequivocal proof. So 
actually, this, sorry, this is Yasir Qadi, and then he quotes Al Qari, who says, The opinion that the companions left out six Ahraf is strange and extremely weak, for it claims that part of the Quran was removed by consensus of the companions, since, since each of the Ahraf is part of the Quran. Therefore, how could Uthman, or any of the companions for that matter, or rather all the companions, discard something from the Quran without a clear proof from the Creator. So what we show is that Tabari, he said that Uthman got some, um, you know, inspiration, divine inspiration from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to burn this Quran. Yet what we have here is that one of their scholars, Al-Qari, he realizes how bad it is in reality to actually say that some of the companions burnt these Ahraf, which is in fact a dominant opinion as we have shown. So it is not just us as the Shia who say this, rather what we say is that unfortunately um, this image that has been given of the Qur'an for those who research, when we see the Christian researchers and the non-Muslim researchers, when they look into these matters, they say that you guys cannot have your Qur'an preserved. So brothers, um, what we say is how, how shameful is it that when the Muslims come out and strongly condemn this pastor, in the United States who previously wanted to burn the Qur'an, we see that one of their righteous, so-called righteous Khulafa, Uthman, had no shame in burning the Qur'an. Someone who the angels were meant to feel shy in front of. Yet this is how he would treat the Qur'an by burning it. So what we say is that if you want to argue that all of the Ahraf were preserved, then this is not true. Why? Because the companions had these recitations that we do not find, we just find it in the ahadith that they recited in such a way. And then if you say that no, one harf exists, one only is preserved, then some of your Qur'an has been lost and actually six-sevenths most of your Qur'an is missing. So whatever way you deal with these seven ahraf, if you go with the opinion that they're preserved, you've got a dilemma because they um, it's clear that they are missing. And if you say that no, only one is preserved and the others were burnt, then your Qur'an has also been burnt. And sorry to just recap on that other opinion, just repeat that again. These people will argue that no, these Ahraf have been preserved, or some of them have been preserved, but as we clearly know from the text, it shows that no, much of it has been lost as these recitations from those of the Tabi'een and the Sahaba the Tabi'un and the Sahaba, Waqattab or Umar's way, Dalin. None of these exist today in the present Mus'haf, and we don't find them even in the present Qiraat that they have and that they try to justify. And as we know, Allah Subhanahu wa Taala mentions in the Holy Quran that do they not meditate on the Quran? Afala yatadabbaroon al Quran. Because if it had been from other than Allah, they would find much ikhtilaf in it, much differences of opinion. And what do we have with them? They cannot define the seven ahraf. They believe some of these seven ahraf have been burnt. And of course, taking their sources would show us that this Qur'an is not preserved and that this Qur'an was added to by men, as some of them admit. Therefore, this Qur'an cannot be a full text from Allah. And it completely drops that argument and what we say on this issue to conclude is that our Qur'an is revealed in one harf as taught by the Imams and their Qur'an is in the seven ahraf which the scholars cannot even define. Now what we do dear brothers and sisters, I want to show one clip from an associate from Muhammad Hijab. Because when you look into their text, some non-Muslims they find this, they find what is actually in their text and they confront them with this. And one of the associates, associates of Muhammad Hijab in this video, he's dumbfounded. He, he really doesn't know what his texts say when it comes to the Quran. So let's show this clip and then after that we'll comment on it, inshallah ta'ala. Yes, the Quran. Be yes. Do you know at least two chapters of the Holy Quran yes. has been eaten by the, a tame sheep? Okay. The, the chapter of breastfeeding okay. and the chapter of the stoning woman. Do you have evidence for that, sir? Yes. Aisha, okay. Aisha said in a Sahil Muslim and Sahil Bukhari. <laughs> Yes. We were pro preoccupied yes. by the death of the Prophet Muhammad. Yes. We had a tame goat, yes. no sheep. He said we have a tame goat okay. and the tame goat came yes. and he ate the two chapters.
Now, if it's been memorized by people, let's suppose that the goat ate two chapters. Uh -huh. Do we have thousands of companions that know the Quran by heart? Yeah, okay. So even if that verse was eaten, for example, wouldn't they say, okay, it's okay, we'll just write it on a new copy? Look, she's not talking about, she's talking about two verses that were eaten by the goat. Last yes. day, yeah? yes. That's yes. what you're saying. Yes. I'm telling you, you're telling me these verses were gone. I'm telling you, there was thousands of companions that knew it by heart. Dear brothers and sisters, welcome back. As you can see from the following clip, um, one of the people speaking is, of course, a Coptic Christian. And to be fair to him, he does reference this hadith wrong. However, the associate of Muhammad Hijab is dumbfounded and he does not know about this hadith which exists in their books. So how does he try to pass this off as, no, this is, um, you know, this is not a proof on us? He says that this hadith is fabricated so that a domesticated animal went into Aisha's room and casually ate up some of the Qur'an under the pillow. Is this a fabricated hadith that he's tried to pass off? Because as we say, see many of them, they spend time on weakening and trying to make traditions fabricated when it goes against them, especially when it even proves the fada'il, the merits of Ahlul Bayt alayhim salam. So let us look in Sunan, sorry, Sunan bin Majah in volume three. So this is volume three published again by Darus Salam. And we look on page 113 to show the reality of this tradition that one of Muhammad Hijab's associates tried to avoid. And because if they accept this, it actually proves tahrif. So dear brothers and sisters, let's see the real grading from the big muhaddif, from the big scholar who is venerated and respected Al-Albani in the Salafi world. So do we trust Muhammad Hijab's associate? Do we tr trust his grading on this hadith? Or do we trust Al-Albani's? Because he tries to claim that it is fabricated in that video. So that the lay people, they say, oh, you know, yeah, the, the Coptic Christian, he can't use that against us. Let's see what he says. On page 113 of Sunan bin Majah, uh, volume three, what do we find? It was narrated that Aisha said the verse of stoning and of breastfeeding an adult ten times was revealed. Um, dear brothers and sisters, I, I'm not going to go into what that topic is because um, it's really not appropriate for this time to go into what that is, but you can research it yourselves um, and I don't want to feel sick. But the verse of stoning and of Adult fosterage is a more appropriate way to put it. An adult ten times was revealed and the paper was with me under my pillow. Or yes, under the pillow, under the bed. When the Messenger of Allah died, we were preoccupied with his death and a tame sheep came in and ate it. So here it says a tame sheep, some say that it is a goat. And as it says here, it says Dakhala Dajinun So Dajinun, when you translate it, can be a domesticated animal. So this is the hadith that the Coptic Christian tried to quote. How do we see the grading by Al Albani? Hassan. It is a Hassan hadith. It is not a fabricated hadith like the associate of Muhammad Hijab tried to claim. It is not a weak hadith. It is a Hassan hadith according to Al Albani. So the grading that is under Sahih, it is a Hassan hadith. And even if we try to say, dear brothers and sisters, that, okay, they try to claim that some of the Salafi muhaddifin try to claim this as weak, as a weak hadith, then does, does Muhammad Hijab's associate not feel embarrassed that he threw out the word fabricated rather than weak? He tried to say it's a fabricated hadith. And as we've shown, it's not, it's actually a Hassan hadith according to some of their big scholars such as Al-Albani who is many of his gradings are relied upon and what we find furthermore dear brothers and sisters because we want to well, there has been a lot of reading and sources but it is necessary but to finish off this episode inshallah ta'ala we say that the argument that he gives to the Coptic Christian he says that no even if that's the case then he tries to say that the Sahaba the companions memorize some of the Quran is this really the case 
The Sahaba memorized the Quran as we've shown that they, okay, so even if it was eaten, they still have it. Let's, let's see firstly what Qurtubi in a tafsir says about this hadith first. So we see that one of the wives of the Prophet Aisha, some of the Quran was under her pillow and it was eaten. Qurtubi in tafsir, in his tafsir al Qurtubi, volume 7, page 113, what does he say? He feels embarrassed. So what does Qurtubi do? He blames the Shia and the atheists. He says that this is something that the atheists and the Shia would say, that the Quran was eaten under the pillow of Aisha. Qurtubi, Sunan bin Majah says this. Sunan bin Majah says this, and is, this is reported in Sunan bin Majah. This is reported by Aisha that what the goat ate Quran. So Qurtubi, what is he saying? He says an atheist. Dear brothers and sisters, let's look at the first premise. The first premise is that according to Qurtubi, that atheists and Shia narrate that uh, this is something that the atheists and Shia would say that a domesticated animal ate some of the Quran. It is narrated by Aisha that some of the Quran was eaten by a goat. Therefore, according to Qurtubi, what conclusion would we arrive at about Aisha? And this is not to be disrespectful or hurt any of the viewers or any of my brothers and sisters from the so-called Ahlul Sunnah who are watching. And I don't mean to come across as arrogant, but what kind of conclusion would we come to when a scholar such as Qurtubi says in his tafsir al-Qurtubi that this is something that the Rawafid, the Shia and the atheists say, yet Aisha herself narrates that a goat ate some of the Qur'an. What would we conclude on this issue and what would Aisha be classed as? We leave it to the viewers to do that. So what we say is that Muhammad Hijab's associate in the video, he cannot argue that the Quran, even if it was eaten by a goat, is preserved because what? Let's, let's quote this here. Zayd bin Thabit, one of the companions, did not even accept Omar's opinions with regards to the verse of stoning in the Holy Quran. He doesn't accept it. So your Sahaba, Zayd bin Thabit, he did not accept Omar's opinion about some verses related to stoning, a rajam so Therefore, even if you want to give this argument, it collapses in front of the non-Muslim. It collapses. Why? Because your Sahaba didn't even trust each other. Why? We find in Al-Itqan by Suyuti, part 1, page 168. During the collection of the Qur'an, people used to come to Zayd bin Thabit with the verses they memorized in brackets. He shunned recording any verse unless two witnesses attested to it. The last verse of the chapter of repentance was found only with Khuzayma bin Thabit. Zayd said, record it. Record it because the apostle of God made the testimony of Khuzayma equal to the testimony of two men. Omar came with the verse of stoning. Pay attention, dear viewers. Omar came with the verse of stoning, but it was not recorded because he was the only witness to it. So this other companion, he has a testimony which is equal to that of two men. But one of the biggest companions, he, Omar, he brings this verse and he's not trusted. He's not trusted with this verse to put in the Holy Quran. It continues. Omar apparently said, if it were not that people would say Omar has added to the book of God, I would have recorded the verse of stoning. Part 3, page 75 of Al-Itqan. So here, what does it show? They did not trust Omar. Omar believed this verse was in the Qur'an, the other Sahaba did not trust him. Therefore, again, how can you trust your Sahaba, your companions, memorization of the Holy Qur'an? And what we say is that we let us look finally at Sahih Muslim, volume 4, page 103. And we will see again what it says with regards to the preservation of the Holy Qur'an. Here we go, we have Sahih Muslim. Volume 4 is from the same set of the last Sahih Muslim that we showed for the Waqad Tab that was added to the verse. What do we do? We go to page 103 again. We go to page 103 and we see that yes, so Muhammad Hijab's associate was dumbfounded by a Coptic Christian quoting this hadith. Some of the Quran has been eaten according to Aisha. And then we see that this is not fabricated, it's actually Hassan according to Al-Albani. And we find further evidence of tahrif with regards to 
adult fosterage in the Quran and these um, verses. So what we find is that Aisha said again, among the things that were revealed of the Quran was the ten definite breastfeed, the ten de definite adult fosterage. I'll say I, I don't want to say this uh, word. Um, that the ten definite adult fosterages, if we can say it that way, I don't know if it's gra grammatically correct, that make a person mahram. Then that was abrogated and replaced with five definite adult fosterages and the Messenger of Allah passed away. Passed away when this was among the things that was, were recited in the Quran. So they try to use the argument of abrogation. They try to say that this is abrogation. But we see in Sahih Muslim Volume 4 that it was already abrogated. This matter of adult fosterage was abrogated from 10 to 5. Okay, But then we see that the 5 is not to be found in the Quran today. So what do we say? We say that according to Aisha again, some of the Quran has been lost and we do not find these verses in the Quran about adult fosterage. So what we say, dear brothers and sisters, with a final argument is that one Salafi, he might come to you and he might say, this is abrogation, because I've seen some of them argue with this, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala abrogated these verses, so the goat ate them, so there's no problem. Is this, dear brothers and sisters, the disrespect from the, for the Holy Quran? That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would make a goat walk in and eat some of the Quran? I really ask my brothers and sisters from the sect who refers to itself as Ahlul Sunnah to really think and use their aql, use their intellect. This individual, Muhammad Hijab, tried to argue that the Quran for the Shia is not preserved and that their Quran is preserved. See, you have these seven Ahraf. You have your companions reciting verses in a way that are not found today. You furthermore have a goat eating some of the Quran, which is a Hassan hadith. You then have Aisha talking about a verse that was talking about the ten sucklings revealed to the five, which is not found in the Quran today. How on this, uh, how can any rational person, after reading these sources, say that the Quran, according to the Salafi, according to the sect that refers to itself as the Ahlul Sunnah, that their Quran is preserved? What we say in conclusion, dear brothers and sisters, is that our Quran for the Shia has been preserved. And we can prove this, as I mentioned, from the points from the Ahlul Bayt, salam, from their narrations, it shows us that the Quran has been preserved. But despite many of our, our brothers and sisters genuinely believing that the Quran has been preserved and using this as an argument against the non Muslims, we find, unfortunately, that when we delve into their texts, that the Quran for them is, has no solid foundation and is very shaky indeed. And any non Muslim who does his research in a correct manner will discover this, that they have no basis and no argument to say that the Holy Qur'an has been preserved. So dear brothers and sisters, we have responded to Muhammad Hijab with regards to Tahrif. We showed that you cannot try to say that our Shia believe in Tahrif because of some book that was written by uh, one scholar that was condemned by many and we also showed a book written by one of their scholars regarding the Qur'an. Now if he wants to respond to these um, evidences that we put forth and if anyone else wants to respond to these evidences we put forth, we request that you do not reply by starting to look at our books, rather you reply to the evidences we have put forth because of course if they quote our books they don't have a holistic reading of it and they will take things completely out of context and not compare them to the other narrations which clearly show the preservation of the Qur'an nor will they quote many of our scholars and classical scholars which Muhammad Hijab failed to even quote who argue for the preservation of the Holy Qur'an so what we ask is that these evidences which any rational thinker would have um, uh, scrutinized whilst we mention them we ask that these evidences are replied to these authentic and solid evidences which show that their Qur'an is completely corrupt and that there is no basis for their Qur'an from books like Sahih Muslim, from books like Sunan bin Majah, from books like Bukhari that show that they have no basis to say that their Qur'an has a solid foundation. So a response 
would not be just taking things from our book. A response would to be actually reply to the evidences that we have presented. So dear brothers and sisters, I thank you for joining me in this episode and I apologise that it has been long, but rather than putting it into another two episodes, we did want to finish this in one episode so that in the next episode we can get onto the differences between the Shia opinion of the companions and the opinion of the so-called Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'a. I thank you for joining me um, and please join us next time. رب صل على محمد وآل محمد وعجل فرجهم والآن أعداءهم اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد وعجل فرجهم والآن أعداءهم